Welcome, everybody. Quick question to begin with. Who's here because the title implies eating chocolate? <laughs> okay. Those of you who are right. But we hope you're now happy that the title wasn't eating your own dog food. So please help yourself, get a bar of chocolate, Swiss chocolate, pass it over to the neighbor. And sharing is caring. So, welcome again to our presentation about the Swisscom internal application cloud and how we, as a DevOps team, became, became customers of it and, and why and how. That's the question to begin. So this is the outline. Quickly, we're going to talk about ourselves, who's talking to you right now, then give some business context, talk about a problem we faced two years ago, then introduce the Swiss internal application cloud, and talk about our journey and our learnings from it. So my name's Roman. I work as a DevOps engineer at Swisscom. I joined the company six years ago, and I'm currently working in the same team as Fabian. So welcome, everybody, also from my side. Uh, my name is Fabian, so I work as a DevOps engineer on the same team as Roman. So I'm mostly engaged in the fields of cloud automation and uh, recently discovering my passion for developing microservices with Spring Boot. Uh, first of all, I, out I briefly outlined the business context in which we operate and how this context has recently uh, changing. So we've been running an enterprise service bus for, for a couple of years now. That means we were focused on aggregate, composing, orchestration of, of data and services from our Swisscom backends, and we create easy-to-use web service for our internal customers, for example, mobile apps or uh, front ends. So it was more the, the classical way, following a, a waterfall approach. Technical requirements came to us from somewhere in the Swisscom. So fortunately, things are changing, and I guess, like many other companies, we've been taking different transformation steps, meaning uh, we are operating as a DevOps team, we're following agile values and principles, and also important, our business model is changing. That means we are less focused on solutions, but more on digital products, which means we try to find uh, a demand and creating more generic solutions. So we are pretty active in the field of voice over IP and, and messaging. So it's not that black and white. We are in a transition phase. Uh, the ESB is still there, but we are focusing on our new business. So in addition uh, to our changing um, business context, we were facing different technical issues. So as you can see over there, over time, a monolith gets rusty. So the same happened to us. Uh, we have a tightly coupled software stack containing of an ESB software, a message broker, and the underlying caching system. And there was a particular use case which was designed just for a small amount of workload. It was pretty expensive in terms of caching and messaging. But over time, uh, this use case became the one with the heaviest workload. And the whole monolith was getting unstable with the poor performance, and we spent a lot of time with, with troubleshooting and fighting those issues. And so we ask ourselves uh, what to do. On the one hand, we don't want to lose uh, the, the customer and the particular use case. But on the other hand, we were pretty annoyed having such an unstable system. So scale out and up was not possible because of technical restriction. So we asked ourselves what to do. We knew that there are concepts and technologies out there uh, which could be pretty helpful for us. For example, applying uh, or separating our concerns with a microservice architecture, or um, yeah, so applying uh, the 12-factor app to, uh, to reduce the amount of, of, of troubleshooting and infrastructure tasks. So we knew that stuff, but we don't know how to get started and uh, how to face these technical issues. And um, yeah, 
we had to run our new business. So at the same time, the Swisscom internal application cloud came up, and we asked ourselves, is this the right place to, to run our services on it? Exactly. So in the, in the same time, we weren't the only ones looking for such a platform as a service. And in fact, in 2016, Swisscom launched a public offering of its own Cloud Foundry-based platform as a service. And then in 2017, it launched an internal version of it, called it the Internal Application Cloud, or in short, IAPC, with some services, not too many, just a few ones with high quality, and they were thoroughly maintained. So that's the, that's the baseline. And there are some extensions to it, some custom services for Swisscom. For example, an identity service to query LDAP, or a smart messaging suite to send texts through an API, or a handy implementation that assists you in managing connectivity requests to outside of the cloud, to the legacy system, to uh, platforms outside the cloud within Swisscom. So as of today, in just 20 months, the Swisscom internal application cloud became home of more than 900 orgs in Cloud Foundry speak, uh, 6,000 applications, and more than 2,000 users. The numbers on the graphs don't matter that much. It just shows the usage, the consumption, just knows one direction. It's increasing every, every month. And one noteworthy number, in my opinion, is that currently there are more than seven terabytes of memory allocated by all applications running in that application cloud. But that doesn't surprise, as Swisscom has a cloud journey, a cloud migration in its strategy. So it enforces or strongly encourages DevOps teams to migrate their workload, their applications from bare metal to, in the best case, to a platform, or if that doesn't apply, to a, a container or else uh, uh, infrastructure as a service. We decided that our monolith can be split up in multiple microservices, and we want to go for the platform as service approach. So the last two years, in our opinion, could be divided in two phases. We had an exploration phase and an exploitation phase. In the exploration phase, we got acquainted with cloud concepts, 12-factor apps, and stuff like that. We discovered the Swisscom internal services we could use. So in, a, in our monolithic ap application, we had to maintain and manage our service by ourselves. We had to have our own implementation. And we thought in, in one particular case where we wanted to, to have a time to live for a document, that's exactly what a, a service like Redis or MongoDB can offer us in the cloud. So drop the old implementation, use the cloud service. And third thing is to completely completely rebuild our CI-CD setup. From, uh, from, from the monolithic approach, we had maybe a day, maybe even weeks, until a code change was in production. And nowadays, with that new CI-CD pipeline setup, we're down to five minutes. A code change is checked in, tested, deployed to test, integration tested or acceptance tested, and then deployed to production. But we still control when exactly that change would go live. So the rollout is still done manually with a blue-green setup. So the exploitation phase is more about moving the, the heavy workload from the monolith to the microservices without impacting any customers. So there's a concept out there from, from Martin Fowler called the, the Strangler pattern. So 
we have no idea that we are compliant with this concept. It more, was more the, the logical way to, to do that migration. So this uh, pattern says there's no way to migrate the monolith into microservices at once. So you have to follow three steps, which means you have to, to duplicate the functionality from your monolith as a microservice. And then you move the related workload from your monolith to your microservices, and then the third step you can remove the functionality, the particular functionality. And you have to do it over and over again until there's no workload left on your monolith and you can phase out um, your old system and infrastructure. So in our case, we had a web server, a reverse proxy with a rewrite engine in place, and uh, we have defined and specified every single migration step. That means there were several input parameters, like the resource path, in our case, even SOAP, SOAP actions, uh, users, and different stuff. So we, we created rewrite URLs um, to move particular workloads to new microservices. And we were able to do stuff like canary, canary releasing, moving 1%, 10%, uh, to, to our microservice. So we were able to uh, drive the migration in, 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 so in, in our opinion and our customers were not uh, having not problems because we were able even to switch back the traffic and uh, that was a very, very good thing. So having the Nginx in place, so after a while we realized, okay, for Cloud Foundry there's also uh, Nginx build pack and so we decided it would be good to, to move the whole workload to Cloud Foundry using the Nginx build pack, so we can use the configuration out of the box. And having the, the workload over there means uh, in the next step, we can apply more cloud native technology like Spring Cloud Gateway, or we are ready now for something like a service match. So we are pretty happy that we are seeing that the service match topic with Istio is in the spotlight here at this conference. So we are ready, so we are waiting for something like that. In our case, we also had to put uh, the monitoring on top of our traffic management because we want to see what's going on. That means we are converting the traffic uh, into metrics in the Prometheus and the Grafana system. So we have different metrics, HTTP codes, response size, uh, response time, everything like that into our time series database. And so we were able to see how our migration is going on and we could monitor the whole stuff. So here's a screenshot from Grafana, which is running on Cloud Foundry as well, uh, which shows just a, a single migration step for a REST resource. So we have started uh, to specify the migration step. Uh, we have moved those resources to our microservices. At the first day, we have started uh, first with 1% and 50%, and we've checked for, for, for a full day, uh, does it look good? And even if there are any customer complaints, and after the day, we move 100% to our microservices. And just, this is just one example, one migration step. We, we do it over and over again and move the workload uh, to our microservices. So another important topic was, uh, yeah, of course, we're having the old infrastructure running on bar metal, and we're having our microservices. And after a while, we see having more and more microservices, even the complexity in the cloud increases. And we were using, looking for something, in our case, at Zipkin, which helped us to, to model uh, our complexity and having an overview of what's going on with our microservice infrastructure. And furthermore, we were able to follow requests with IDs and see in detail what's happening and how we can troubleshoot the whole stuff. So in particular for, for the Zipkin UI, we were looking for something that was not available in our marketplace. So remember, we are cloud users, we are not the cloud team. So we are consuming stuff from the marketplace. And for us, it was some kind of lifesaver, those extension points from Cloud Foundry. So having build packs, creating your own build packs, having Docker images, having user-defined services was for us very important to set functionality which, we are, which, we are, uh, which was important for us but it's not available to, to have in place. Uh, next, we would like to 
um, to, to spot some points out which we think are very important for our migration and maybe are also important for someone who's doing similar things. Yeah, of course, consumers first. I mean, our consumers, they don't care if the request is handled as a microservice or as, as a monolith. They, they don't care. So it's our business to make sure that there's no impact for them. So with applying the strangler pattern, we were able to do it in, in very little steps. And of course, we, we talk to our customers and uh, keeping them in the loop. But we want to be on the driver's seat. We want to move the workload. We want to move back the workload if necessary. So that one very important step we, we thought of our customers and uh, do it the agile way in small steps. Focusing on our business means, uh, as you can see here, it's just an overview of our tech stack having in place before our cloud migration. And the important point here is we were responsible for every piece of software which is shown here. We were responsible for troubleshooting, for optimizing, for tweaking. It was our business to do it good. And having the, the cloud or a cloud foundry in place, at the first phase, it means there's another layer, another complexity. But we, we see when we're using standard services and community stuff, um, in the third step, when moving the monolith away as a container, there's almost nothing left we are responsible for. There's just the Spring Boot application and our code. That's, that's our business, and we are responsible for that. Everything else, the services, is, uh, is placed uh, at our cloud team. And that was very valuable that we can focus on our main business. OK, scalability. Our, our monolith wasn't scalable. With microservices, we knew we could scale. But we still had to figure out when or based on which metric we want to scale. So we, int we introduced metrics and kept them monitored in, in Prometheus or in, and Grafana. Then, because we don't have something like an autoscaler in place yet, we had to manually uh, scale out or in. So that's, that's uh, one point we, we, we learned. The other thing is by removing code, unused code we, we implemented six years ago that nobody ever used, we could still uh, free up resources. And hopefully, in, in the future, when new features come, we can implement them directly. We know they are used. And we see if, if uh, there is heavy use on it, we can scale appropriately. And the third thing is, in, in our opinion, it's important to use the right tools or the right framework for the job. We think, in our case, Spring, Spring Boot, Spring Cloud was the perfect framework for, for our problems. And we're still fascinated to, to see how easily Cloud Foundry, Spring, and external services like RabbitMQ work together. So invest time, check which framework is the right for your job, and benefit from it. So our, our journey continues. It's not yet over. There are still things to do, of course. Um, the ESB is still there, but we are waiting for a container as a service offering available within Swisscom. If it's there, we can bundle and ship the remaining functionality from our monolith as a container to, to a container as a service platform. And if it's done, so there's almost nothing left. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The slide was missing. So when we are, um, when we are able to ship the remaining part as a container to container platform, there's nothing left and we can remove the whole network infrastructure, uh, infrastructure stuff and the certificate and the VMs and everything which is on bare metal, uh, we can just remove and uh, having the, the stuff on Cloud Foundry and the container system. Uh, furthermore, we are, want to embrace features like the autoscaler to be more efficient with our resources. And um, last, there are 
security features or we are waiting for something which is available for, for, for our security needs for CredHub. So we are in touch with our cloud team. And as soon as possible, uh, we want to integrate CredHub in our setup. So first, thank you for your attention. And also a big thanks to our cloud team, which brought the Cloud Foundry platform to us, which allowed us to redesign our stack and to be ready for the new business. So thank you very much. Questions. Questions. Thank you. Can you elaborate a bit on the remaining stuff that don't fit uh, Cloud Foundry yet and needs to be bundled into a container? Uh, that they're not 12 factor compliant? Can you elaborate a bit on your last slide? This one? Yeah, the first line. Um, um, the remaining parts, they don't fit into Cloud Foundry. That's why you bundle that as container. Can you detail a bit why they don't fit into Cloud Foundry? Um, yeah, you're right. It's, it's an option. We can um, think about, in our case, it's a mule ESB. We could try to, to run it as a container or as a build pack with a Java build pack on Cloud Foundry. But there are still some additional processes which are connected uh, to, this, uh, to this ESB. So maybe it's easier to us to have a container and attach additional services for monitoring, um, which are pretty close to this functionality. But you're right, the Docker functionality is there. But in our case, we feel more comfortable to have it a container runtime for our ESB. Thank you. Good. Then, OK, thank you again. And if you have any further questions, just come by. We're still here.